I was at the speaker dinner the other night, and uh, one of the gentlemen at the dinner that I met, or the other speaker was talking to me about, so um, what is your talk? And I gave him the title, and he goes, uh, yeah, what is a shiny object, right? So I forget the context, <laughs> the terminology is a little different here in Europe. So uh, raise your hand if you understand what shiny objects are. Okay, good. So I don't have to explain too much. But in the context of this talk, um, in the US, you know, uh, we have this term, I, I don't know if it's probably similar here, silver bullet, right, solutions. I don't use that because of obvious reasons. In the US, there's a little sensitivity to things these days. Um, so yeah, uh, so shiny objects are just basically uh, solutions to problems that we all want to believe in, right, to help us when we're desperate, for the most part. Uh, so today's talk um, is going to be centered around that. So before I get into that, I'm going to share a little bit of information about myself. Uh, my name is Angel Rivera. I'm a developer advocate for CircleCI. And uh, as a developer advocate, I love coming to these conferences and speaking to people like yourselves. Um, I think I spoke to a lot of you uh, at this conference and learned, uh, learning about how you use technology and bringing that back to my team so that we can build better tools, right? Uh, but this also uh, enables me to um, you know, share information about uh, how we're using technology at, at Circle and, and, and vice versa. Uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me, uh, please feel free to hit me up on Twitter. Um, these days I travel a lot, so it's the best way to kind of get my attention. I really am not into email, so uh, please just feel free to hit me up. I, I do respond. Um, yeah, so let me talk about a bit about my experience as a developer. Uh, when I started out, uh, my uh, career, I was working in the United States Air Force, uh, US Air Force Space Command, which is now the Space Force, right? They merged that. I don't know if you saw the, uh, the new uniforms. We used to wear these blue, uh, like basically flight suits like the astronauts when I used to go to work. Now it's uh, camouflage. I'm like, what? Like, isn't it space dark? Should be black, right? Anyway, I hope they change it to a black, uh, like cool flight suit. But when I started my career, you know, I was young. Uh, I learned to program professionally in the federal government. And this was in the 90s, so there was no like internet the way we know it today. Uh, when I developed code, it was siloed on my own, on a Windows machine usually. And then when I was done you know, compiling my release, it would go on a floppy disk or a zip drive. Remember those? Anybody remember zip drives? Yeah, see? <laughs> anyway, so it was the 90s. Uh, or we would burn it to a CD, right? And then walk down the hall to the data center. So this was. Um, on uh, Cape Canaveral, so we're launching rockets, and I'm working at NASA, and I'm going in to this data center and this security everywhere, and knock on the door, and it's the system administrators, right, <laughs> all in one room in the air-conditioned uh, uh, data center, and they're like, all right, who the hell are you? And I'm like, I have some software to <laughs> the release. It's like due tomorrow. Give me that, and they close the door, right, shut the door in my face. But I've always been a curious developer, right? So I consider myself a developer with uh, operational tendencies. And the reason is, when I was younger, I was like, well, I'm writing this code, I'm spending a lot of time on it, and then all I hear back from the, the operators were, hey, your shit doesn't work, right? It's broken, and here's a log file <laughs> on, the, on the CD or the, the floppy, right? And yeah, that really pissed me off, because I wanted to know how the what the next steps were for my software. It's like you're sending it into a void. So when I started going into uh, the op center, I was just persistent, kept going, kept going, and eventually they realized, like, oh, this guy just cares, right? He's a developer that actually cares. So um, I guess it's kind of, I was doing DevOps before the term DevOps became, uh, you know, normalized today. Uh, and what I did learn, though, was uh, as I was talking to the, the system administrators, they started realizing that, like, I cared, and then they started giving me root access or pseudo access to servers, right, so that could help them deploy, and we actually started working together as development teams, right, and, and operations teams. And I learned so much. And throughout my career, ever since then, I was literally working uh, every job I went as a developer. I, I consider myself a developer to this day, but I would sit in a you know, development team writing software, and then I would go and deploy it and help the system administrators deploy this software. After a while, they were like, hey, why don't you just work with us <laughs> as a developer? So you know, I, I lived both sides of the house, and it was, it was really enlightening. All, most of my career was like that. And today I want to share a story about uh, my experience working on a really, really good team of, of developers, very experienced, and a, a really, really good team of experienced uh, operators, and tell you how we 
uh, experience a shiny object moment together. So yeah, like I said, I was working with a team and we had really strong developers, really strong ops people, DBAs, right? Really good team, cohesive. So a lot of the folks were a little mature. They understood um, how to communicate with each other. Uh, it was a really strong team. And we were asked to build a new uh, UI for uh, some features that the, the customers wanted, and we were excited to build it. Uh, I was working on the uh, front end team, building out these new features. And back then, you know, we, we were using SQL databases, so everything was kind of a flat structure. And at that point, we had to build a hierarchical model. So obviously JSON, right, to fit uh, these new frameworks that were coming out and people were, were using them. And it just made our lives easier, right? The data was structured really nicely. We wanted to uh, modernize a, a bunch of things. Um, but there was a problem. I don't know if anyone ever you know, worked with uh, uh, relational data models and then tried to make them nested in hierarchy, right? I think I had a couple conversations with some folks yesterday about this, and it was really hard. Like, we had link table after link table after link table. Things were slowing down. Indexes were like just total trash, right? It was, it was horrible. We were really frustrated in trying to come up with a solution for this. I mean, we were reading books by uh, Kelko. I don't know if anybody read that book about SQL and, and, and basically mapping you know, uh, hierarchy structures. It was a mess. So I was on my own working with an open source project called MongoDB. So I said, wow, this is amazing. Anybody here ever hear of Mongo? Anybody use Mongo? Do you love it? Awesome. I saw that <laughs> a little head shake. But anyway, yeah, I was like, this is great, right? The data is already structured. We just submit it as it is. It, it, it persists as it lies and bring it back and forth between the, uh, the uh, system, the service. It's, it was great. Uh, the problem was it was still kind of new, uh, the technology, right? And a lot of fo folks didn't know about it. Uh, how, how, the, how to use it, right? Uh, they didn't understand. We didn't understand um, the complexities behind that. Uh, but we didn't care. We were so desperate that, you know, when I showed it to the team, they were just guffawing over this, like, wow, this is the solution. So, you know, whatever, silver bullet. It's awesome. And I'm like, yeah, but nobody knows it. That's all right. We'll figure it out, yeah, as we all do, right? So we agreed, uh, the ops side and then the uh, development teams, we were like, okay, this is the solution. Let's move forward. Management signed off on it, and we re began to work, right? We started building out the infrastructures. The operational teams were building out clusters. They were, you know, creating DR capabilities, uh, HA, making sure everything was, you know, failing over, all that stuff. Those are the easy parts for, the, for that team. So again, no MongoDB experience, right? And I was the guy driving <laughs> this, which I was just learning it myself. But we were all excited about this new product and using it in our, in our, in our uh, development process. So we quickly built the uh, minimal viable product, pitched it to everybody, showed it. Uh, they signed off on it. And then uh, we you know, built out the, the legit release for, for the application based on the MongoDB uh, cluster. And we did, you know, we, we made quick work of that. Uh, we actually finished it uh, about a month ahead of time, roughly. And, you know, everyone was happy. Management was, like, excited about it. Uh, our customers were excited. And we were super, super happy about deploying this thing. Again, customers were super happy, you know, and, and they started using it right away, immediately. And uh, we saw huge, uh, you know, peaks and, and spikes, and, and then they never, they never went down. It was just uh, kept going up, ascending. So we like I said, we were super proud of ourselves. Life was good, right? We were just ecstatic until <laughs> go hit 90 days. Fast forward, yeah? Bum, 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 right? Mongo uh, starts kicking over, clusters are, are you know, uh, our Nagios is just blowing up, <laughs> alerts everywhere. We're seeing uh, high disk thrashing, uh, memories just peaked, CPUs peaked, it's just a disaster. So services are failing, we're getting customers are calling, hey, I'm timing out, nothing's happening. And like I said, we were a good team. We went and started troubleshoot mode, right? Put our hats on, start looking at logs, start looking at all the details. And we quickly figured out what was going on. The <laughs> volume was about 15 million uh, records in MongoDB, they call them documents. And you would think, yeah, this should handle this, no problem, because we have 
tons of beefy machines behind this, right? And, and we were just befuddled, like, what's going on? And when we started doing a deeper dive into this, of course, my queries were <laughs> shit, right? It's terrible. I didn't understand what was going on until I looked at, like, you know, online, started looking at, we called Mongo, they were really generous in helping us, but like, pretty much the queries were garbage, indexing on, uh, on the wrong things. Um, and if you really boil it down, what had happened was, uh, I don't know if you all know this, but MongoDB is non-relational. So that means um, all the normalization that we were used to, that I was used to, I was recreating that inside of MongoDB, which is, by the way, never, never, ever, ever try to do that. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> don't do it. It doesn't work. I don't care. <laughs> if you think you got a hack for it, it's not going to work right. And we also, uh, so yeah, so we, we discovered what was going on. And we quickly realized, right, to get to recover the system, we decided to do some math and said, all right, well, it was working up until 15 million records, so let's take the least used or you know, least access records, move them over temporarily into a uh, kind of cold storage so that the system would recover. As soon as we did that, right, moved over however many records, boom, the system was back up and running. We didn't have to reboot a server. Literally, it just started working. Uh, and then we got to work on a solution, right, for a permanent solution for this. But the damage had already been done. And our customers had experienced uh, you know, th this outage, and it was terrible, right? Uh, the organization that I worked for and our customers lost a lot of time and money. And this was the thing that hurt me the most, was like, our team lost all of our street cred, right? Literally, we were just <laughs> in, in, in shatters, right? We were just, uh, it was inconsolable. We were very disappointed in ourselves. Um, so everybody familiar with the term hot wash or post-mortem, right? We, we, as, like I said, we were professionals. We conducted a, a postmortem trying to analyze what had happened and then fix the solutions, come up with uh, ways to not happen, make this happen again, right? So, of course, right, bad programming queries. These are all obvious. But one of the other things we discovered was we were so confident that, you know, we just neglected any kind of testing. We were like, yeah, this works. It worked in, you know, the typical, typical when you're a developer and you, it works on your local machine and <laughs> everything's cool, but when you start adding volume to it and right, it's, you don't test anything, we didn't do any load testing, nothing. So that was a big mistake. And obviously, right, we didn't properly vet the technology. We didn't understand Mongo's capabilities and we were totally in the dark on uh, how to actually manage it, right, and uh, configure it, manage it, and then also, right, the data schemas that we were doing, uh, I was doing, they were totally off. So that's the story <laughs> about my experience and my shiny object moment, our shiny object moment with MongoDB. And now I'm gonna talk about a little bit of things, and these might be obvious to you, but I'm gonna share them anyway. So um, let's talk about avoiding those situations. Number one, don't believe the hype, right? So if you find that your team is so arrogant and <laughs> complacent, there's a problem, right? Start addressing that. I don't care, you know, it may be just one person that feels that way, but it's okay to voice your opinion and start getting your teams to, like, understand, hey, I think we're getting over our, our skis here. You know, we're, we're a little bit uh, complacent. Um, and just be on the lookout for, you know, that kind of um, complacency because it's, it's a problem and it, it just degenerates uh, the team and the culture. From there. Obviously, thoroughly vet unit technologies, right? Understand the capabilities. Like with me, in my example, I didn't understand the non, uh, relational, no relational database schemas, right? I didn't understand um, that you couldn't do link tables or you shouldn't do link tables within this, this platform because it's not built for that. Now, today, I think MongoDB has, uh, uh, has actually added uh, like atomic uh, transactions uh, and there's also um, a relational. Uh, components now that you could actually implement. But back then, right, this was very early, age, uh, early stage for the, for the product. Uh, but again, you know, thoroughly vet the technology, understand, just look past the, the, uh, the, the marketing material, because like, that kind of got me too, is like, oh, you don't, this is the fastest database for any kind of web app. Oh, wow, yeah, I like that. Um, don't believe it, uh, or, or at least, you know, do your due diligence. Um, I definitely recommend with all the technology today, we have like Docker, we, I just sat through Joel's talk today. You have Docker containers, right? Stand stuff up in those environments and then that also actually helps you to equalize, right? 
uh, your development environment, and then also you can equalize your uh, staging environments, you can equalize your production environments to a degree, right? Uh, it's, Docker's, don't let it become your uh, shiny object, but it can, it can also, uh, it, could, it, could, it could work and help your teams kind of, you know, work through the software development problems. Uh, I've actually, you know, at CircleCI, we use Docker all the time, and it's, it's really great for, for our development teams, and it, you know, it you literally helps us deploy applications quicker. Um, so, yeah, start, you know, looking for technologies that everyone can understand and share, and there's a low barrier of entry as well. One of the things that we did was we broke protocol, right? SOPs, everybody have SOPs? Raise your hand. I, no? Wow. Okay, and the next slide's for you guys then. But basically with protocol, right, uh, and SOPs, it just helps you document what you're doing in your processes and your operations. Meaning if you bring a new person on board, right, to do some work, then you want to give them these uh, documentation, like a standard operating procedure, so that it standardizes and it brings consist consistency to your, uh, your operations. And also, uh, it, it, it lends itself to also being a very, very, uh, what do you say, uh, it, dictates, it dictates all of your processes. Now, one thing I will say about uh, SOPs is if you have them, make sure you iterate over them because what worked yesterday will not work tomorrow, right? Uh, always, I, I have a rule when I was managing teams, I was like, look, we have to look at our stuff every 30 days. If there's a change, we're using a new technology, let's update the documentation, right? And it also keeps management off your back. A lot of times if you're working with big companies these days, you need to have that documentation. They want to see it. And so if you're a startup and you're thinking you're going to go work for Google, with Google or a bank or whatever, big corporation, this documentation, just do the work up front, get it done, maintain it, because you're going to need to every year annually certify things. Remember that. <laughs> big piece of advice I can give you. If you don't have SOPs, <laughs> please start building them. Like I said, the benefits are um, the consistency, right? So you're literally documenting how you do business uh, in a technical way. You can even automate them these days, right? Like, I don't care if you just stick a document up in GitHub and have a version, you know, it, version controlled. Um, just build something. I see this in a lot of, like, uh, startups, new teams that are within organizations. Sometimes uh, big companies will start, uh, like, a research and development type team, and these folks don't build any kind of documentation, and next thing you know, uh, they're, you know, it's a year in and have to build up all this kind of stuff. It, it just start off the bat doing it, you know, and that you'll get into a, a flow, and then your culture will kind of evolve around that, and that's one of the best pieces of advice I can give you to avoid, like, shiny object syndromes. And don't set and forget. One of the things that we did was when we implemented MongoDB was, like, oh, yeah, the teams, like I said, we were very complacent, and we set this thing. We never, nobody was actually monitoring it. We just had Nagia saying, hey, if you hit a, th a threshold, kick off an alert, which cost us. So I'm going to switch it up a little bit here. So obviously, right, technology isn't about, is about people. It, it, it helps our lives, right? It brings convenience uh, uh, for us, uh, lets us do things consistently and in a stable manner. Uh, and when you have people involved, that usually means there's a culture, right, forming. And cultures are... Uh, things that, uh, you know, uh, generate attitudes and, and, and uh, help people kind of uh, form bonds. Um, and it, it also brings people together in a sense that, you know, you can work together sort of for a certain goal. Now, I'm going to talk about, <laughs> everybody know who this guy is? I'm from New Jersey, by the way, so I had to make a reference uh, for Jersey. This is Tony Soprano from The Sopranos show, yeah? All right. So I'm going to talk about managers and some of the traits of management that, you know, uh, if, if you are a manager, maybe just refresh you a little bit. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk about individuals as well. So uh, I'll talk about my style of management. A uh, long time ago, I coined this phrase, uh, pseudo management. And the reason why I call it pseudo management is when I joined teams as a manager and when I used to manage people, I would tell them, look, I am a peer, I am a colleague, right? While we're doing the day to day work, let's you know, share the wealth. And uh, I would pitch in where I could. Now, when I needed to do managerial things, and you know, I'd tell them, hey, I'm going to pseudo up, <laughs> handle the HR stuff, handle conflict resolution, whatever it was that was going on that day. And then I'd exit gracefully and go back to work with them, right? Uh, what I found with this style of management, it helps with folks uh, giving them, kind of knocking down those intimidation barriers, right? So it gives them a sense of ownership. 
And I've been doing this about 15 years with this kind of style, and I, I really enjoy it. And a lot of folks, um, you know, I get a lot of, I used to get a lot of work out of people, and they felt really good about, you know, the work. And they, like I said, they owned their, their, their piece of work. They didn't feel like, oh, he's the manager, or, or this person's that, right? It just broke down all those intimidation barriers. And they saw that, and it's the old military thing, right? It's a lead by example, for the most part, but with a little twist, right? So again, as a manager, always empower your people. You want them to uh, own their, their decisions, right? Um, a lot of times, uh, when I, even to this day, sometimes I see it uh, when I'm working with partners, uh, some managers are telling their people, you know, like, oh, you gotta check with Jim, or this and that. I didn't run my shop that way. I was just like, look, if you're interested in doing this, own it, build it, and then share it with the, with the, with the team. And let's make decisions based on, on you know, what you're showing us. And a lot of times we would improve on those ideas, and they were really good ideas. Uh, and we had a culture of, you know, basically empowerment. This is really important. <laughs> I work for a CICD company, but, you know, there's a reason why I work there, and because I believe in this. Um, as, as developers, right, we're always failing, and that's a good thing, because you understand how your system, right, you start forming uh, the, the way your system's gonna work, processes, you understand your limitations, you understand um, when things are failing, all right, that's great. Now I need to find a, a, a solution for that, right? And it's okay to fail. That's how we learn. That's how things get better. Mentoring is really important. Um, you should always foster a, 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 a culture of mentorship. Um, you know, empower your uh, subordinates to uh, or feel comfortable uh, to, to come to you for, for things that, you know, you're an expert in. And if you're not an expert in something, find someone who can mentor them. Uh, it, it's a really important um, growing uh, uh, con contribution, right? This is something I struggled with quite a bit, uh, making those hard choices. Sometimes, you know, you really like your team, you really like the personalities on your team, but sometimes they, they, I think we all outgrow, right, our jobs and our roles. And when it comes to that, managers, you know, you have that personal connection you're doing more damage by keeping people who are not really fitting in or not contributing. Um, and you don't have to fire them. You, you can, you know, recommend them to another unit or team or whatever. But sometimes you do have to fire them, and, and that's okay. Like, I, have an, I had an experience where I had a, a person working for me, and, you know, I was paying him a certain amount of money, and I was really conflicted about firing this person, but he was dragging the team down. And I was, and finally I had to, I had to make that choice. When I let him go, he reached out to me about 30 days later. He was a little angry, right? Uh, but I let him go as, as, as gracefully as I could. And he says, hey, uh, by the way, thanks for firing me. <laughs> and I thought, oh boy, here we go. Like the first, that was the, the subject line, thanks for firing me. And then I read the message and it was like, I'm making like, you know, I think he got like a 60% raise, <laughs> right? So, and he was much happier, right? So he was, it was actually a thank you letter. Uh, which, you know, again, it, it'll work out if that's the, the worst case scenario. But definitely, if you gotta make decisions, make them and, you know, don't look back. So let's talk about individuals, right? Like us, all of us, if you're not a manager. Um, yeah, don't have this attitude. <laughs> I hear this quite a, more often than I'd like. Um, like I said, this is a way for you to level up. So if you're an individual and you know you feel like, oh, well, that's not my job, I, that, I think that's a terrible attitude to have. Uh, it, it's it's self-defeating, number one. Number two, it doesn't bode well with your colleagues either, right? Like, and then that also is, creates these toxic uh, cultures that I've worked in, uh, in, in many companies and organizations. So yeah, you know, try to level up and, and understand that you're a contributor on a team and, and that affects the culture when you're, you know, we all get frustrated, I get it. But sometimes when you're just consistently, take a break, maybe you need a, a vacation or talk to your colleagues, be like, hey look, I don't know, I can't handle this. It's okay, you'll be fine. This is a really annoying one. <laughs> when someone points something out in, a, in a, a pull request with no solution to it, right? Don't do that. If you have a solution, or if, you, if you point out, yeah, this is broken, have some, you know, even if it, it's not the right solution, have some ideas, it's okay. Put yourself out there. Uh, no one's gonna be laughing at you, right? You're contributing and you're offering up and you're being, you know, you're, you're showing a little bit about your, 
your um, knowledge and things. Um, just don't leave it uh, broken and, and sitting there for someone else to repair, right? Or, or team up with someone. Sometimes that's what I do is I work with someone that I know, hey, he knows about Kubernetes or, or uh, you know, uh, Docker, and we work together and we, we, we build out solutions uh, for like some serious problems that we have. Anybody ever get one of these? Yeah? I used to give them out like candy <laughs> back in the day. But uh, yeah, if, if you're a mentee or some, you know, you're, you're under someone's wing, um, have respect for their time. Uh, put the work in. Because I always say this job as a developer, it's 90% learning, in my opinion. right? And then the 10% is doing. So you're constantly learning. Things are changing. right? PHP, obviously, what, 25 years now? Right? It's changed a lot from when <laughs> I started. And you have a ton of different um, avenues that it went down. But at the, uh, you know, it, it just shows that technology is constant. It's going to change all the time. So we're constantly learning. Um, and as a mentee, right, if you're being mentee, uh, mentored, you know, put in about, I would say on average, like 20 minutes. If you don't figure something out in 20 minutes, then reach out to your mentors or someone else. Uh, I used to get folks that didn't even, you know, I'm like, did you look at it? <laughs> did you even, like, read? No? Come on. <laughs> right? So help yourself. And, and again, it's another way to level up in your skills. So, uh, yeah, I have a hard time with this. I still struggle with this. So I'm always looking for ways to improve my listening skills, meaning, you know, uh, sometimes you're in a meeting, things are, you're excited because you have an idea. Maybe someone sparks an idea when they're speaking. Uh, and then I just jump in, and it's 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 not a good it's not a good look and not a good fit. So I struggle with this. My advice to you is all to just sit back, let the people finish their thoughts, and then you know, add your own. Um, and no matter how wrong they are, <laughs> and when you disagree, just you know, be polite and say, well, I have a different perspective and and such. Uh, I know as engineers sometimes we're a little short with each other. Uh, let's not do that. Oh, sorry. And then the last, I think, uh, this is the last tip here, is uh, learn how to communicate. Just like that example I shared with you when I read that subject line, right? Like, hey, thanks for firing me. <laughs> I was reading way too much into it. I was thinking, like, oh, either this guy's going to piss me off or <laughs> this is going to be, like, I just thought negatively, right, right off the bat. And literally, when I opened it, read it, I almost started crying. Like, wow, this is amazing. I fired a guy, and he's thanking me for it because, right, he made more money. Uh, so, like, I would say don't infer uh, any kind of emotion from text. That's one of the things that it's sometimes, you know, we get, uh, we're in a bad mood and we read some text, an email from someone, and then we start kind of saying, oh, this person's bad. If you feel that way, give them a call and say, hey, let's have a coffee and talk. Because I promise you, most of the time, it's gonna, there's be no emotion to it. There's, the intention is, that you thought was there is not even there. And I can tell you from experience, I've done this so many times in my life. I thought I'd share that with you. So in summary, tech problems are not tech problems, right? It's, it's all about culture. And we need to, especially today in this day and age, and this is kumbaya and I'm going to say it anyway, we should all be respecting each other. Let's try to like, have an open heart, open mind, and especially with our peer, uh, peers and colleagues, right? It's really important. We spend more time with each other than we do with our families in most cases, right? And you don't have to love each other, but I think you have to have a mutual respect. And I just want to ask all of you, right, before you leave today, to let's drink some beer together, but let's go move forward and leave here and build better cultures together, right? Let's get our people... Uh, happy and, and, and enjoying the innovations that they bring. Uh, let's, let's, like I said, have an open heart, open mind. I think the world really needs it, especially in this day and age, yeah? This is all I have. Thank you. If anybody wants to reach out, Twitter, yeah? Thank you.